Great music this morning, isn't it? That's so great. We are lucky to have these guys, aren't we? Um, <clears throat> so today we're going to, the, the, the topic of the, I don't know if y'all get my uh, talk titles, but uh, the talk title is Who is Jesus? And I, uh, it's always a, it's a big subject. It seems like it might be a very simple subject, and for some places it might be a very simple subject, but when I think about who is Jesus, it's quite complicated. I started thinking about it earlier this week, and then on Thursday I got this wounding in my eye, and um, I thought, oh, it's just like Jesus. He cries with one eye with compassion for the world, and with the other eye he's happy and excited. I thought, I'm finally getting there. Anyway, um, you should know this. Uh, there's a, a few jokes about Jesus. <laughs> and the first one I'd like to tell you is Judas. Remember Judas, the guy who betrays Jesus? He goes, hey, Jesus, you come into the Last Supper? And Jesus says, the what? <laughs> the supper, I mean the supper. <laughs> says Judas. <laughs> what did the Tibetan monk say when he saw the face of Jesus in a tub of butter? Oh, excuse me, a tub of margarine. I can't believe it's not Buddha. <laughs> Boom. And then finally this one about aliens. So there were uh, aliens come to earth and you know, you know how it is. Uh, we asked them if they know Jesus. And they go, oh, yeah, 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 we know him. He comes, comes every couple of years. And the Pope, who's in the interview with the, the uh, aliens, is kind of incensed. He goes, every couple of years? I've been waiting 2,000 years for Jesus to come back. And the aliens said, well, so what y'all give him when he got there? Got here. <laughs> I said, uh, what do you mean? He says, well, we gave him chocolate. What'd you do? That's the end of the joke, right there. <laughs> okay, uh, so Jesus in a more somber way. Um, as you know, uh, the information we have on Jesus is very small. There are four gospels that exist now in the Bible. There were more than that, but when I read those gospels, I also get the same sense that they had a point of view that they were trying to put across, um, a story they were making up about Jesus, and each one of them had a purpose, and they told the rest of the story about Jesus to come to that, so that you would come to the conclusion that they were trying to put forth. And in the Gospels, they come right out and say it, you know, we're, we're writing this so that you might believe that he is the Messiah. Very simple straightforward, which also, uh, if you don't know ancient um, writings, um, that type of writing is somewhat like comic book writing of today. It's basically, it uses stories to make a point, and it's not necessarily, at least the genre, which was common other than just the Gospels, and, and that, that type of writing really is more or less like propaganda, we'll say. It, it hasn't, it's not dedicated to simply um, the facts as we would call it today, but they're written with an intent. And so when you get, when you realize that, then, then you realize that the data that's in there may not be what we would call facts, but persuasive elements of an argument in favor of an idea. That kind of takes some of the way we discern what is true historically and makes it a little more difficult for us to interpret. And so it has given rise to the realization that there are other ways of interpreting Jesus, and that has been happening quite a bit in the 20th century. That the, the understanding, the scholastic understanding of who Jesus is has been more and more informed by the general conditions of the population at the time, and they then take those 
sociological and political ideas that they have garnered from other texts of what was happening in the first century, and they apply that to Jesus. And so one of the books of the last decade was called Zealot, in which Jesus becomes portrayed in this book, also a form of propaganda, in my opinion, as the zealot. And it reduces his other aspects down to mostly being a one of the many Jews in the time period when Judea was ruled by the Romans and the cooperating ruling class of Jews, that he was one of those people who wanted to overthrow that system. And as you know, the Maccabean Revolution happened around that time period. The temple was destroyed because the Romans got tired of the Jews rebelling, and they just said, well, we're just going to stop this, and they wiped out the temple. That's why the temple um, of, da of, they call it the Temple of David, but really Solomon's temple um, is not on the Temple Mount now. It's because the Romans obliterated it. And now on that Temple Mount, there is the dome of, uh, is a mosque. Little aside. So, Jesus comes, and what he is trying to do is invoke God, according to one book, invoke God to destroy the Roman Empire, or at least its control over Palestine. And that's why he throws himself toward the cross, to in to inspire that. Another one says he's just got captured. It doesn't much matter. That's a form of interpreting the facts about Jesus by determining what the conditions was he was in. And some of his actions, like clearing the temple, which is clearly um, an affront to authority. And so that's one way. Then you know there's the traditional Christian one, which basically says he's the son of God. It's one, one of three parts of God. He's not really emphasized as being human so much as being emphasized as being the great exception to humanity, the one who was God itself, hanging out with the other parts of God, the Holy Spirit and God the Father, and decides to come to earth to make a sacrifice to appease somebody for the sins that we have done. And this sacrifice is what allows us to be saved as human beings. And without Jesus and our agreement that that's what he had done, we will not survive um, in the afterlife in a happy way. And so Jesus is the great savior, the survivor. I mean, the savior, and, and, and we survive because of him. And, and that is very popular in Christianity today. It is um, not, as I was talking with a, a very scholastic friend of mine recently, it's, it's not very in line with Catholic theology, though many Catholics say that. One of the jokes that I um, have not, did not tell you was, how do you make an atheist? And the, the punchline was, <coughs> you raise them as a Catholic. Um, the, 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 the deep and scholarly, the deep and scholarly um, theology of the Catholic Church is much m more nuanced than that. And it basically emphasizes more the dual nature of Jesus, which was hotly debated for centuries and basically decided on around 300 that Jesus would be both fully God and fully human. And that became their definition which satisfied both sides of the, of the debate and brought Jesus into balance as both the great example and the great exception. And so that, that is another form of theology that has in many places in the Christian tradition has, has lost a lot of its um, 
its equality, its balance. Um, but it was traditionally, it was the, the original Catholic, meaning universal, idea of who Jesus was. Now in the Eastern Orthodox, it's a bit different. It's, it's a, it, I think they're much more, they lean a bit more on the human side. Um, and, and this is all just background to say that, you know, there have been many interpretations of who, who Jesus is. Many interpretations because, I, see, I think, basically when we look at Jesus, we don't have direct experience like, uh, oh, I grew up with him, he lived next door, I've watched him all my life. We have instead experiences around Jesus, many of them told to us by other people, and sometimes people have direct experience ourselves. And so what we have is really a reflection of our experience when we look at Jesus or talk about Jesus, rather than the facts, ma'am. It is, a, it, I don't want to say it's quite this simply, but let's just use the phrase, it's a projection of our own consciousness when we talk about Jesus. It's much the same as you know, you meet many people in the world. Let's take the two political present people. Many people project, I think, their thoughts on those people, and they are neither one of them are exactly like that, right? But we think we know them right? We didn't grow up with them, but we've been told they're certain ways, and so that's how we believe them to be. You do that with your neighbors. Uh, you do it with your spouse. You sometimes see them clearly, but many times you see them as you are rather than as they are, right? And when we come to Jesus, I think we have the perfect example of very little facts that we could count on, so we count on what we have been told or what we have experienced is my background. When I was about 16, <clears throat> I had been reading the New Testament uh, one chapter a day every day of my life for several years. And by the time I turned around 16 years old, it dawned on me, and I cannot tell you where it came from because I grew up in Sanford and it wasn't like a hotbed of theological dis discussion. <laughs> but it, it dawned on me that the deeper truth was that Jesus was not the only Son of God that we all were. Now, I don't think it's inconsequential that I was born the second son in my family. Can you all get this idea that if there's only one son who's the son of God, or maybe it was something like that. My, my brother was even named, he was a junior. And so you can see psychologically, I might have needed to have that be true, right? But anyway, I came to this conclusion that Jesus was not the only son of God, that we all were. And um, I was advised by my parents to talk to the minister of the church. It was a Presbyterian church. Now, if you know the Presbyterians in general, I'm going to make a generalization, they tend to be relatively rational people. And um, so I go in to speak to this guy. I'm 16, he's 50 something. And I tell him my thoughts. And he sits behind his desk and he says to me, well, if you can handle the heat, you can have that belief. Now you do the math on what he meant. <laughs> and so I sat with that for a few weeks and I realized that for me, if I have to trust anybody, I'm gonna trust myself. And so with that, I said, okay, I can't say the Nicene Creed, which says Jesus is the only Son of God. I'm no longer part of this community in the way I had been up until that point. Which was a little disappointing because I had thought I'd be a minister when I was from the t for at least 10 years by the time I came to that, which kind of kicked me out of the whole church idea. 
because I'd never heard of any church that didn't say Jesus was the only Son of God, and that's all there was to it, so I was done with church, which left me a little wandering as far as what my purpose in life was. But I seemed to fill it with fun things to do, so it wasn't that bad. <laughs> now, when I came to Unity for the first time, it was after I was in seminary for two years at a Presbyterian seminary in my hometown in California. I had been saying no to a lot of things they were saying in that seminary. And it was more or less, an, I had, my identity was more or less described by that resistance rather than by affirmation. So when I went to Unity for the first time, and they didn't say anything I didn't like, <laughs> I was going, well, this is pretty interesting. And so then the, the next week I went to a week-long seminar on what Unity teaches. And I felt completely off balance, physically off balance, because I wasn't saying no anymore. I was so used to saying no, I couldn't really, my identity was lost. My sense of what held me up was missing. And here's what Unity says, more or less. Because in unity, there's variation also, right? Everybody's projecting all the time, so in, but in general, here's what unity would say. Is that unity would say, yes, Jesus is the Son of God, but so are you. Well, that kind of answered that 16-year-old thing for me. Yes, but so are you. And you being a human being, and Jesus being fully a human being, Jesus then becomes the great example of how to live life in such a way that you can deepen into your highest aspects of yourself, your divine nature, and you can awaken to that. And when you awaken to that, in many ways you will resemble Jesus and do, as he says, greater things than these. Among those greater things than these is to be at peace, to love your neighbor as yourself, to be someone who recognizes their inherent worth as a human being as a child of the one living presence. And that is who you really are. Now, you may do miracles and all that, but just coming to this deep realization that you are essentially a part of the one presence, one power, you are that incarnate also, this is radical, though not exclusive unity, because in the East, they say the same thing all the time. It's not such a great stretch in Hinduism for you to say the self resides in you and you need to awaken to it, the self with a capital S, which is another way of saying you're Christ's presence. It's another way of saying you're I am. This I am, which Jesus claimed to be the great I am, is the same I am that you invoke every time you say I am blah, right? And so this feeling that you can get when you awaken to your real nature is that you would have love for all that is because at that point, you no longer see the world in opposition and no longer have to push against it. It becomes your home. Perhaps it's a place that's not yet awakened, but it is your home and the representation of the one presence made manifest. And so there is beauty in life as it is. And you're not so much in need of being saved as being awakened. And this is what unity would say. And that seemed to satisfy for me something um, that had been obviously around for some time in my psyche, like what is the nature of Jesus? But because really I was asking, what is the nature of reality? 
And the reason I went into psychology when I went off to college was because I was sure that religion didn't have the answers at that point. What is the nature of reality is the same question as who is Jesus? It's the very same question of who are you? Because you and reality and Jesus are all bundled up in your perception of it. And you pull one piece out of the Jenga and the thing collapses and you have to rebuild it. So you need to think about that fairly clearly. I was talking, you know, we do spiritual dialogue here at one o'clock, one, I mean, 12 to one thirty. And actually, uh, I just should let you know that uh, this Thursday after we do spiritual dialogue, Tia is going to be teaching you how to use your iPhone or your smartphone better. And she's been doing this. She's gotten a lot of rave reviews. So if, if you're interested in something other than spiritual dialogue um, <laughs> and have some time. And in some ways, this magical little box has left, given us so much data and information that, you know, sometimes we forget to do the deep thinking. And I was saying last week in this thing, you know, many times when we talk about spirituality, especially in this milieu, that we think it's, oh, it's just the heart. But no, you can use your mind. But you have to use it in a non-repetitive way. So do you know how hard it is to think a new thought or to question your very thoughts so that you can go deeper and how you actually have to stop everything you're doing and sit right down and press against your resistance to actually have a novel thought. It doesn't come easy. It doesn't roll off like we, what rolls off is repetition that you have said to yourself a thousand times. And the idea of a new thought sneaking in there doesn't come without some effort. So what I recommend, if you're really curious about who Jesus is, get down to the question with questions, not with answers. Come to say, what is it I don't know that I need to know? What is missing in my understanding? How is it that this is the way it is? And is that really true? That's how you explore your inner understanding of the nature of who you are, who the nature of Jesus is, and the nature of reality. You come to that, and you may invoke your heart in that process. You may use your heart as one of the wise parts of your being, but this totality of mind that you have is not the enemy. It can be your liberator. And the theologians of the past were not sloppy about that. They penetrated to the best of their ability their personal experience so that they could come to a deeper understanding of the nature of reality, Jesus, and themselves. They did that. And it's why sometimes it's worthy to read their writing. Though most of the ancient writings is really difficult. But allow yourself to ask these questions. I think the weakest thing about Christianity these days is the lack of deep reflection. And because of that, we think we know who is a sinner and who is the saved. We, know, we think we know who's in the club and who's out of the club. We don't come to it like Jesus did and say, you know, everybody's in the club. Instead, we use judgment because we've been told, programmed, and repeated over and over. And that thought comes again and again and again. And the prejudice comes again and again and again. And what liberates us is to really go beyond that. And to ask yourself, who am I? And who could I be? This, I hope, helps. 
you know, last week I talked about this longing in my heart that was the sense that I had um, be habitually looked to the outer world to fill this hole, this missing, this something, this incompleteness. And you know, you do it by ha having friends or lovers or by your job or by your children or some people by their pets. But the healing hasn't happened yet when you need that as your first order of business. The healing happens when you find your deeper connection to the whole of you or to the whole of this. And the deep and profound longing for that is what draws you to go deeper so that you will have that deeper connection. And when you have that, then all that is topping on the cake. Your lover, your friends, your dog, even your cat, is <laughs> toppings right, on, right on, on that. And so what I think in this season, in this season when the days get longer and there's still enough light that we don't get depressed, let's go deeper. Let's ask these questions. Who is Jesus? Or who am I? Or what is the nature of, pure, of existence? Or, and how can I touch the divine in such a way that my heart becomes whole? Let's do those deeper things rather than repetition. Let's be new. Let's be intentional. Let's be bold, right? And you may not like everything you discover in the process, but it is, it is, the, it is uncovering that which has held you back. And if you, find it, then you can fix it. But if you don't see it, what can you do about it? So it's a big ask, I know I'm asking. But use your mind and your heart to go deeper. We have always said, for at least 15 years, we're a spiritual community awakening to our divine nature through love, service, and personal transformation. And this is a concentration on personal transformation. Let's lean into it. Let's really lean into it. And let's do this together. And maybe in your small groups as you're discussing, you'll go, you know, I just need to tell you this. Or maybe you'll hear someone else say that and, and it will spark in you a deeper understanding. But this is the nature of spiritual development. And each of us is a Christed being capable of doing this. So let us pray. What do you feel when you feel yourself? And what do you see when you look in the mirror and you see an image? And what story do you tell about yourself? In so many ways, these could just be habits. Let us go deeper. Let us ask with the intention of awakening. There are books. There are podcasts. There are conversations. 
to be explored. But most importantly, there is you to be explored. Let us truly awaken to our divine nature by opening our hearts and our minds and asking and listening and awakening. And so it is. Amen. help on this. One power, one power, one power. There's one power invisible, and you see it everywhere and every day. One power indescribable And you speak of it with every word you say Mysterious until you know the truth It's as simple as the love inside of you You can call it God, call it spirit Call it Jesus, call it Lord, call it Buddha, Vashahula, angel's wings or heaven's door, but whatever name you give it, it's all one power, can't you see? It's the power of the love in you and me. One power, one power. One power. We speak so many languages, have different clothing, different skin tones, different names. But different is only dangerous when we forget that in the heart we're all the same. We'll remember once we close our eyes to see that such distances were never meant to be. Call it God, call it Spirit, call it Jesus, call it Lord, call it Buddha, Baha'u'llah, Hashem, or Heaven's door. It's Muhammad, it's your mind, it's your soul or it's your sign. It's the universe, it's music, Mother Earth or Father Time. But whatever name you give it, it's all one power, can't you see? Whatever name you give it, it's the very air we breathe. It's the power of the Lord that lives in you. One power, one power, one power, oh, it's one power, one power.
it's an everlasting peace the freedom of forgiveness the sweetness of release the joy of inspiration it's the sunshine on your face the birthright of all nations and it's the boundlessness of space it's the beauty of a baby the serenity of sleep the anger we abandon for it's the love that is most deep it's one one power what we are one is power. one One power, one, one power, one power. Oh, it's the power of the love that lives forever in you and me. Power of the love in you. people that are going to become new members of our church and have a sense of belonging here. New members have the ability to vote at our annual meetings and also receive a monthly print jacket card. So there are nice benefits. So today we're going to be having four people join us today. So the first one, Carol Stout, will you please come forward? Congratulations. Thank you. So Claudia Boykin. As a, it is our tradition here to bless these people, but let me first say, you know, for m many, um, not everybody, but for some people here, this has been a long time coming. And, <laughs> <coughs> and one of the things that is true about s even some of our uh, staunchest, uh, strongest supporters, in people who are deeply involved with the church, they have never joined the church. And um, obviously you don't have to do that to be deeply involved, to volunteer, to give, to do anything. But I do think it's psychologically, when you do join the church, you are saying internally to yourself, as well as to the community, that I belong here. And that can be a deepening that allows you to really uh, feel more fully uh, supported and loved in this community because you have said yes to the community. And just like, uh, um, just like so many things, when we finally take that final step across the threshold, we don't think it would be, mean much, but sometimes it really does. So I invite you to do that. And I wanna thank you, especially Betsy here, for <laughs> stepping forth after many years of being here, and for the people who didn't take 10 years to do it, thank you for that. <laughs> okay, let's stand and give them a blessing. Okay, um, how does the thing go? <laughs> yeah, we love you, we well, hold on, we love you, we bless you, we appreciate you, and we behold the Christ in you. Let's say it together. We love you, we bless you, we appreciate you, 
and we behold the Christ in you. Thank you so much for being here.